it was oh great it's all right you can still tell me that. we're gonna Sherry, sherry's gonna tell me a story about when she left the barn i was just gonna tell you i i left the barn it was 11 42 i drove i i i drove up to the barn this morning and i drove whipped down here jumped in the shower did my got dressed did my hair made a coffee i was here at two minutes after 11 i was just proud of myself <laughs> well thank you hey hey matthew welcome matthew's our first viewer hi matthew of the stream we haven't really started in with the poetry yet are we gonna throw so, an invite I, the reason it. i the reason the, now let me just explain why the stream is later than it than it used to be I, I for the next eight weeks i'm doing a class with jordan daniel wood and it's a really good class and he is He's very generous with his time in the Q and A, so the class is so it's supposed to be like basic seven to nine, but it tends to run late, and then I kind of need a little bit of a mental break before I jump right onto a stream. Yeah, after the class, so um, so that's why sure. I think I think eleven eleven o'clock is because last time I came in late and was rushed, and um, so. I think without latency and then I have to, then I also have to confess. It's like, so it's like, I was doing pretty good at the early part of the poetry month with the prompts. Oh, me and too. Then, and then my, <laughs> then I could use my birthday as an excuse, but it wasn't just the <laughs> fact that my birthday, there wasn't, I didn't just get sidetracked by my birthday and my birthday celebrations. I also like was dreading that April 5th prompt. You knew what it was? Because yeah, because I knew what it was, and it's what like no, it? I don't want to look at that. I don't want to look at that, and I don't <laughs> know if I'm ready to share. I finally got around, so I'm going back. I'm going through. I'm going to catch up. I get. I, I will. I will produce a poem for every prompt. Oh gosh, um, you're going to you're going to actually catch up. Oh, I will. I I'm, I'm debating. I'm debating whether to just jump in again or catch up. And of course, I'm not doing anything <laughs> while I debate. I'm catch, I, I I am going to catch up. And I've kind of no, I have a notorious reputation for like, uh, definitely like if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. Let's just like, mm -hmm. no matter the cost. So yes, I will figure out a way to get it done. Yeah, I'm really loving that class. It's so good. Oh, um, I can imagine. It's probably amazing. yeah. The, the I'm actually I'm I think there's a way in which I'm gonna I'm gonna actually relate this to poetry. If you give me a moment here, but there was this there was this thing that came up toward the end of the Q and A section of the class, one of the other students in the class was talking about um, uh, creatio per, per verbum as opposed to creatio, creatio ex nihilo. Huh. And I like seized on that immediately. Actually, well, on the tail, like Jordan kind of set me up because Jordan immediately, when he was responding, he starts talking about the enunciation. Um, and I'm, and I immediately was all over that because the thing about creatio et per verbum is that it points toward the, the invitation to response, the invitation to dialogue, the invitation to our participation in the activity of creation. And so that really the cre God's act of creation that we see in Genesis isn't really complete until the Annunciation, when Mary responds to the word that was given. Oh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so, and Jordan did too. Jordan was all over that, and it was it was really really great conversation. Now, how does this relate to poetry? Well, because I think poetry is the kind of word yeah. that is given that is also looking for a response from the reader yep. for your your participation, like poetry is not just a passive activity. Even the act of reading poetry is not passive. Mm. It invites the po a, a, a good poem. It invites you in. Mm -hmm. It invites you in. You participate with it. You enter into it. And then, you know, most people who love poetry also end up at least trying to write poetry themselves. Like that's, I don't, I have, I don't know that I've any, I don't know that I've ever met anyone who really loves poetry, who doesn't, at least a try to write poetry on the side a little bit as a hobby. Yeah. Just like, I don't understand. Like, I, I don't think it'd be possible. It doesn't like, there's something about the nature of poetry. It's, a, it's basically impossible to have that kind of totally passive relationship with it. Like I know 
there are people who are big fans of music who don't play any instruments and don't sing, but just passively listen to music. I don't know that that's true of poetry, but uh, in the same way. Well, I and guess I, don't... I think everybody gets moved by both poetry and music at some point, even if they are mm -hmm. passive listeners most of the time. Right. <clears throat> and you know, it's it's interesting. What did I, oh, I just used the word moved, right? Yeah. And oh, I listened to a really great talk by Malcolm Geit recently, and he was talking about. And I always wondered about this because it's in McDonald's imagination essay, actually. He uses the okay. same example, but he was talking about Aristotle's um, motion. Uh, and I don't know what Aristotle's theory of motion is, but um, maybe you do. Can you tell me what it is? <laughs> yeah. You know, so you know so like that's like the, that. So that is the Aristotelian. Uh, argument for the existence of God is based on observation of motion. Right. Um, so that because you end up having to, to to posit a first cause of motion that is itself unmoved. Right. Um, and this is what we refer to as God. Okay. Except for, so here's the thing. Here's the thing, though. This is interesting that you bring that up. So in this very same class, like as part of this post-class Q&A, yeah, kind of conversation. That was one of the other things I was engaging with 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 Jordan about is that there's a way in which, like, because because God is love and love is in fact is in fact emotion. He's emotions who who he he is in some sense all he is in some sense also emotion. But because that motion fills all things, it is also we can also think of it as 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 static and stable and unmoved so it is an unmoved motion that is in the motion of all things right and, and filling all and then, things and then mcdonald and and malcolm guide in his talk both both point to the word emotion right yeah. as right. being the same thing it's a movement and i just used it that's what made me think of it of the example when we hear music and we hear poetry you know, even the even the you know the most stoic of of all of us is at some point moved, moved, and then if you take that concept and and drop it right in your little love bucket there, Nate, mm -hmm. <laughs> what are we being moved by? Hmm? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And 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 that would also explain why. Anybody who hears poetry would would want to write it because there's a love there. There's a relationship. You know, poetry is also it's also uh, um, it allows for or it affords, if you want to use for Vakey's terms, epiphany, unveiling, right? And um, a lot of people, a lot of people have the the unveiling when they read a poem or even when they write a poem but they don't often know what it is that's being unveiled. Like it, that unveiling right. often has to continue to reveal itself down. No, the that's road. absolutely right. It, that's absolutely right. It's like most of that. Too, that's most of the time, most yeah. of the time. And in fact, I would say that if the epiphany of the poem is easily articulable, it's probably not that profound. Right. No, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's why you can't say you can't you can't a, point directly at the thing. It's always right. esoteric, not exoteric, right? Yeah. So if a poem like allows you to intuit something that you can't quite articulate, but that you but you can see it when you read the poem and feel it when you read the poem, but you can't quite say what it is when you try to explain it to somebody else, that means it was a really good poem. Right. And <laughs> and and this just goes to prove how important images are. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because it's the images that reveal the it's the beauty that reveals the truth and the goodness in in the thing, right? Yeah. The deeper, more profound truth and goodness. Yeah. Yep. So who wants to come and share poems with us today? Let me go ahead and drop the mm -hmm. invitation into the chat. The less that the less we hear from me and Sherry, I think the better for these streams. I really want to hear from 
All of well, you. Thanks, Nate. <laughs> just kidding. I love listening to you, Sherry, but I also would like to get our audience just like, involved. Oh, I know you are. So I would the artist turns the mask to a veil with magic, but only the individual can do the unveiling. Yes. This actually I think has to that's interesting. Yes. This I actually I think has something to do with the way that we hold one another another one another's faces for each other is why what McMurrow says there is true. Yep. Well until we have faces. I have a, I have a poem that I feel like reading today that's rather long. Okay. Um, maybe that will give it, maybe that will give people time to gin up the courage to come in here okay. and join us. <clears throat> and in the meantime, I'll go ahead and start. You've probably, you may have heard Malcolm Guyte read this before. Which is, what? what is it? It's the Tennyson poem, The Lady of Shalott, which happens to oh, be one yes. of my favorites as well. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. All right. So for all those who haven't heard Malcolm Guyte read it, um, hopefully my reading will be decent. It's not going to be as good as Malcolm's, but I'll do the best that I can. On either side of the river lie long fields of barley and of rye that clothe the wold and meet the sky. And through the field the road runs by to many towered Camelot. The yellow leaved water lily, the green sheaved daffodilly, tremble in the water chilly round about Shalott. Willows whiten, aspens shiver, the sunbeam showers break and quiver in the stream that runneth ever by the island in the river, flowing down to Camelot. Four gray walls and four gray towers overlook a space of flowers, and the silent isle embowers the Lady of Shalott. Underneath the bearded barley, the reaper, reaping late and early, hears her ever chanting cheerily, like an angel singing clearly, o'er the stream of Camelot. Piling the sheaves and furrows airy, beneath the moon, the reaper weary, listening whispers, tis the fairy. The Lady of Shalott. The little isle is all enrailed with a rose fence, and overtrailed with roses by the mer by the marge unhailed, the shallop flitteth silken sailed, skimming down to Camelot. A pearl garland winds her head, she leaneth on a velvet bed, full royally apparelled, the Lady of Shalott. No time has she to sport and play. A charmed web she weaves, so she weaves all way. A curse is on her if she stay, her weaving either night or day to look down to Camelot. She knows not what the curse may be, therefore she weaveth steadily. Therefore, no other care has she, the Lady of Shalott. She lives. She lives with little joy or fear over the water running near. The sheep bell tinkles in her ear before her hangs a mirror clear, reflecting towered Camelot. And as the and as the mazy web she whirls, she sees the surly village churls and the red cloaks of market girls pass onward from Shalott. Sometimes a troop of damsels glad, an abbot on his ambling pad, Sometimes a, cur a curly shepherd, shepherd lad or a long-haired page in crimson clad goes by to towered Camelot. And sometimes through the mirror blue the knights come riding two and two. She hath no loyal knight and true, the Lady of Shalott. But in her web she still delights to weave the mirror's magic sights. For often through the silent nights a funeral with plumes and lights and music came from Camelot. Or when the moon was overhead, came two young lovers lately wed. I'm half sick of shadows, said the Lady of Shalott. A bow shot from her bower eaves, 
He rode between the barley sheaves. The sun came dazzling through the leaves and flamed upon the brazen greaves of bold Sir Lancelot. A red cross knight forever kneeled to a lady in his shield that sparkled on a yellow field beside remote Shalott. The gemmy bridle glittered free, like to some branch of stars we see hung in the golden galaxy. The bridle bells rang merrily, rang merrily as he rode down from Camelot. And from his blazon baldric slung a mighty silver bugle hung, and as he rode his armor rung beside remote Shalott. All in the blue unclouded weather, thick jeweled shone the saddle leather, the helmet and the helmet feather, burned like one glowing, one burning flame together as he rode down from Camelot. As often through the purple night, below the starry clusters bright, some bearded meteor trailing light moves over green Shalott. His broad, clear brow in sunlight glowed, on burnished hooves his war horse trode. From underneath his helmet flowed, his, his coal black curls as on he rode, as he rode down from Camelot. From the bank and from the river he flashed into the crystal mirror, Tira Lyra, Tira Lyra, sang Sir Lancelot. She left the web, she left the loom, she made three paces through the room, she saw the water flower bloom, she saw the helmet and the plume. She looked down to Camelot. Out flew the web and floated wide. The mirror cracked from side to side. The curse has come upon me, cried the Lady of Shalott. In the stormy east wind straining, the pale yellow woods were waning, the broad stream in his banks complaining, heavily the low sky raining, over towered Camelot. Outside the isle, a shallow boat beneath the willow lay afloat. Below the carven stern, she wrote, the Lady of Shalott. A cloud-white crown of pearl she, she dight, all raimented in snowy white, that loosely flew, her zone in sight, clasped with one blinding diamond bright, her wide eyes fixed on Camelot. Through the squally east wind keenly, blue with folded arms serenely, by the water stood the queenly Lady of Shalott. With a steady stony glance, like some bold seer in a trance, beholding all his own mischance, mute with the glassy countenance, she looked down to Camelot. It was the closing of the day. She loosed the chain, and down she lay. The broad stream bore her far away, the Lady of Shalott. As when to sailors, while they roam, by creeks and outfalls far from home, rising and dropping with the foam from dying swans while garblings come blown shoreward so to camelot still as she both still still as the boat head wound along the willowy hills and fields among they heard her chanting her death song the lady of shalott a long-drawn carol mournful holy she chanted loudly chanted lowly till her eyes were dark and holy and her smooth face sharpened slowly turned to towered camelot for ere she reached upon the tide the first house by the waterside singing in her song she died the lady of shalott under tower and balcony by garden wall and gallery a pale pale corpse she floated by dead cold between the houses high, dead in the towered Camelot. Knight and burgher, lord and dame, they plank the, to the planked wharf they came. Below the stern they read her name, the Lady of Shalott. They crossed themselves, their stars they blessed, knight, minstrel, abbot, squire, and guest. There lay a parchment on her breast that puzzled more than all the rest the well-fed wits at Camelot. The web was woven curiously, the charm is broken utterly. Draw near and fear not that it is I, the Lady of Shalott.
Hey, Noah, welcome. I was reading along with you, and I have a totally different trans. Like, there's some verses missing in mine. Maybe this is that's the full version. Okay, maybe I haven't abridged. It doesn't say abridged. It's an older book. But yeah. This is the 1832, all four parts. Yeah, same here. But there was some, and the ending was totally different. At the end, it says here, Who is this and what is here? What is here? Yeah, I'm by the light of palace near, died the sound of royal cheer. Yeah, I know that version too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Interesting. How you doing, Noah? I'm doing okay. It was yeah. kind of a it's kind of a difficult week, and so I'm just um well I wanted to sh share with you guys and 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 share some poetry too. Uh yeah. but I won't be able to stay super long. I was voluntold to go to work later today. <laughs> Where do you work, Noah? I work uh for a a I don't know if I want to say the the company specifically, but it's a um I, I do software testing, but we, we're having a big open house. And so there's a lot of people um, from the community who are showing up and I'm uh, explaining what I do in my testing. And my testing is probably the most boring one at the the place. Like there's there's like things being crushed in other parts of the facility and, and things for kids to be really excited about. And then mine is all computer stuff and, and signals. And so it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's. Uh, I'll be in a room without any windows, um, saying hi to the one or two people who walk in. So. Oh wow! But yeah, well, maybe you can yeah. write a few poems. Sure, sure. Suppose <laughs> we're going to have time for this. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of stuff that I um, I have a longer one, but I might I might share a share a shorter one for now, uh, and I'll I'll share a different one later. My head is a clock, keeping somewhat perfect time. Cycles endlessly, without an end in sight. Patterns, songs, patterns get stuck. I should get an exorcism if I believed in that stuff. It's painful, like a scratching. Like the painful itch that comes after wearing wet, cold socks. An incomplete puzzle with pieces missing. Let's try again and see if the count was wrong. Could I have done something else differently? What are the words I could have said? I wish my grandma didn't die of broken breaths. I wish that 10 year old me had my regrets and I could still do nothing about any of it. Let's play it back again. I don't have anything except work tomorrow. Nice. looking for something cherry oh i'm just i was thinking this morning i got a stack of books here of poetry and i thought it would be fun to just uh i've got like what do i got i got page like so sherry i just wanted to explain the the variances of the versions of lady of shallot okay so the so the <laughs> so the one i read is the earlier form the one that you were referring to is the 1842 version which i actually prefer and I read more frequently, but I yeah. just wanted to read the earlier version to shake it up a little bit. No, that's good. I, I like. I think the version. I think the later version is the one that most people have heard. Yeah. So I thought reading the um, the earlier version might uh, just add a little bit of variance. But I like the thing about the earlier version is the earlier version hints at the fact that Lancelot knew her before. Right. Because yeah, <laughs> the later version it's not as clear, you know that that she was known to Lancelot. Um. Okay, I'm gonna read a William couple William Blakes because he's kind of whoops, got unruly hair here. 
<laughs> Couple William Blake because, yeah, he's good. The divine image to mercy, pity, peace, and love all pray in their distress. And to these virtues of delight return their thankfulness for mercy, pity, peace, and love is God, our Father dear. And mercy, pity, peace, and love is man, his child, and care. For mercy has a human heart, pity a human face, and love the human form divine, and peace the human dress. Then every man of every clime that prays in his distress prays to the human form divine, Love, mercy, pity, peace, and all must love the human form in heathen, Turk, or Jew, where mercy, love, and pity dwell, their God is dwelling too. Well, Blake took the incarnation seriously. Blake was on to something. <laughs> oh, for sure. Wasn't he though? You know what's funny? I was thinking about doing a Blake poem <laughs> today too, but you, but and and you, you, you went with a Blake poem. So I got this good. great little book, Romantic and Victorian Poetry. Let's bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I got another one from Songs of Experience, written in 1794. All right, from William Blake. Hear the voice of the bard. This is for you, Nate. Hear the voice of the bard, who present, past, and future sees, whose ears have heard the holy word that walked among the ancient trees. Calling the lapsed soul and weeping in the evening dew that might control the starry pole and fallen, fallen light renew. O earth, O earth return, arise from out the dewy grass, night is worn, and the morn rises from the slumbrous mass. Turn away no more. Why wilt thou turn away? The starry floor, the watery shore is given thee till the break of day. And we'll, I'll, I'll do one more, one more, and then I'm done. The Clod and the Pebble by William Blake. Love seeketh not itself to please, nor for itself hath any care, and for another gives its ease and builds a heaven in hell's despair. So sung a little clod of clay, trodden with the cattle's feet, but a pebble of the brook warbled out these meters meet. Love seeketh only self to please, to bind another to its delight, joys in another's loss of ease, and builds a hell in heaven's despite. <laughs> Played a little mirror game there. We had someone who was uh, making just absolutely insane comments that I had to put in time out. Oh, really? Oh, Wesley, oh yeah. our friend <laughs> Wesley. Hi, Wesley. Sorry you're in time out. Didn't, yeah. Just, just put them in time out. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so that should I, should I share the very, very rough, rough draft of the poem that I got that, that I wrote today, getting back on the, the train of the prompts? Yeah. Hang on just though. Was, no. When do you well, have to leave? How much time do you have? Cause you, yeah, yeah. Let's let Noah read as much as he wants before he has okay. to go for sure. I've got like 40 ish minutes. Okay. Um, well, why don't you do another one? Yeah. Do, do another one, one please. Um, I have a bit of a longer one I can do. Uh, it's do it. kind of between narrative and poetry. It's a little bit writing on the edge, but it was inspired by uh, Brendan Graham Dempsey. Mm, so recent. Yes. Yeah. Well, all the, the, yeah, I haven't been writing poetry that long, so everything's pretty recent. <laughs> <laughs> um, a wrinkled tan hide, tans hide over bones. Tufts of white hair in all the expected places. A man sits on a stump of a throne. My gold at his feet under shin-high water. 
gutters rumble under the torrent this chamber has been filling for a century. Unlike the stumbling shades, I know this man. He holds his abdomen, gripping a familiar wound. My melody has opened the door. The notes whispered to me my last hope, to my dead God. He sat unrestrained, tapping his knee, keeping track of the cold drops drumming against his sun-stroked skin. His wrists were pale, scarred, centuries of rubbing, grinding, tearing against shackles. I suppose his ankles would show the same. Upon my approach, I am met by a stranger's familiar face. He spreads broken, chapped lips. Blood runs down his half-toothless smile. Um, as he holds his stomach with his right arm in, he straightened his spine as he asks, who is the great fool who enters my room? His voice creaked and rippled out, subtly shaking stone. His words were immediately followed by unnerving laughter. In that moment, my hope fell, glass shards filling my stomach. In his life, I gave all I had to my God, my money, my songs, my love, my devotion, my attention. When he died, I gave more than I had to get him back. I followed to the pits of hell, the damp, musty basement. Now his knowing smirk crept like ice up my back, right into my chest. I chose wrong. My world on his shoulders. Where I once saw care, I see the truth. A hatred. A hatred of a proper order that despised him. A lust to see all drawn down with him into this stinking pit. The satisfaction drained from his facade as he folds again in disgust. My knees fall and hit the standing pool, arms stretch to meet the stone floor. I sink deeper, deeper than I know, deeper, deeper. I let go. All that I have is worthless now. I resign myself to the waves. When I hear a new song, as it flips me upside down and calls me home. Hmm. I like the upside down thing. <laughs> Half the people, actually, almost everybody I've I've left that line in for, they they've all said you should leave out the happy ending. You should. Uh, I was like, eh, it needs something at the end. <laughs> <clears throat> There's a lot going on there. It reminds me of the hangman from the Meditations on the Tarot. Hmm being flipped upside down and George McDonald uses that image and I really love it. <laughs> I think it's, it's I talk more about like, it all the uh, time. It's more like the transition from Prometheus to the hangman. Like yeah. that's the sense I get over the course of the poem. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And there's just something about about being upside down. Um you know like if you if you read uh Blake, if you read um, Meister Eckhart, any of the mystics, you really literally are in a, in a world of people who are looking at it from an upside down point of view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's how they see the world. They're upside down. You know, I remember one time um, when we lived in Telegraph Creek, there was this uh, First Nations couple that used to come and bring us stuff all the time. Food. I mean, they they bring us salmon and moose and stuff like that. And and uh, to trade, we would they could go in the garden and take whatever they wanted, right? And they loved raspberries. And so it was towards the end of the raspberry season, and we'd picked a lot of them. And and they and they said, could we get the rest of them? I said, sure, take them. You know. So they went down there, and he laid on his <laughs> he laid on his back in the raspberry patch. And he'd tell her, he'd be like, Flora, over here, there's one was one hanging. Because when you're picking raspberries, the leaves cover the berries and you can't see them, right? So when you're looking for those last few berries, you got to get underneath and look up, right? And, um, and I remember watching them and, and thinking, that's exactly how you need to, like, it's just such a great illustration of, 
most people just pick what they can see from the top. They're looking from the top down, right? Because they're usually the same height as a berry bush. But if you really want the juicy, great, big, fat berries that haven't been attacked by insects or birds, you got to get down on the ground and look up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. One of those little net lessons. Yeah. I've got one here. I haven't read it before, but I just thought it might be interesting. Go for it. I was going to use my poetry books as like, you know, fortune telling and just go boom and read one. <laughs> Lucifer in Starlight by George Meredith, who I'm not familiar with. Are you, Nate? It rings a bell, but I have to look him up. Okay. 1883, this was written. On a starred night, Prince Lucifer uprose. Tired of his dark dominion, swung the fiend above the rolling ball in cloud parts screened, where sinners hugged their specter of repose. Poor prey to his hot fit of pride were those. And now upon his western wing he leaned, now his huge bulk o'er Afric's sands careened, now the black planet shadowed Arctic snows. Soaring through wider zones that pricked his scars with memory of the old revolt from awe, he reached the middle height, and at the stars, which are the brain of heaven, he looked and sank, and sank around the ancient track, marched rank on rank, the army of unalterable law. <laughs> no, let's <laughs> Oh, Wesley. <laughs> Well, I have one uh, that might be in honor of, of Wesley a little bit. All right. <clears throat> Where is this God of plenty? I'd call him if I had his numbers. He'd let it go to voicemail as he organized his orgies. I wait for someone greater, a God to bring our fool into line. Each day, the skin creeps closer to bone. My son coils around an empty stomach. The streets about our temple are dusted, our little Pompeii buried in cocaine. Blind beggars beat each other for a taste of the dustpan to catch a drop of wine poured out on the steps. Would a wind blow through my home, extin extinguishing the braziers and crumbling the altars, knocking over the banquet tables? Would our priests feel shame at the cool of this breath? Would they cover their nakedness? before one greater than Dionysus. That's a good one. Oh, you, got, you got another book for us? Me? Yeah. No, I was just going to look for one that I wrote. I don't know, it just came to mind when Noah was reading oh, that. Oh, right. I would, of course I want to hear a Sherry poem. Um... Just trying to remember what it was about now. <laughs> what was it that I heard that? Um... Mm -mm. Slip my mind now. Let me just look quick. Uh, is this it? Nope. Someone has to read another one because I'm still looking. All right. Let me... Uh... So I'll look at George. You read that poem earlier, was from George Meredith. I had I'm 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 just going to give a little background on 
George Meredith. Meredith. Oh, thanks. So, yeah. Looks like so okay. his dates are 1828 to 1909. Um, and looks like so. The, and the poem you read was what from the was from the 1880s, right? So 1883. Yeah. 1883. Okay. Uh, he actually he was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature seven times. Wow. Um, not a not a bad accomplishment. He, he, he also wrote novels, um, which were innovative in their attention to the character's psychology, and he portrayed social ch change. His style, both poetry and prose, was noted for its syntactic complexity. Oscar Wilde likened it to chaos illumined by brilliant flashes of lightning. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the feeling I got when I read and when I was reading that because mm. he's got like his punctuation is really interesting because you think he's going to end right. the sentence, but he's got a comma and then he ends the sentence. And then his last line is the second sentence. So it's like two boom booms right after each other, you know? And um, yeah, it's good. Okay. I found the poem I was looking for here. Let me All just right. read it quick. It's called renewal. A slow breath, a small death lingers like frosty droplets of air that emerge as I speak. As I speak, I speak out words that rise and fall and find wings. Who speaks? Who am I? Trampling the body and squeezing out the lifeblood. In one moment, I stop and listen. A still small voice speaks as I speak. It speaks and I speak. I bend low, crawling through the moth-eaten deeds of my youth, brushing away tears. I see you, and you see me. Welcome, Adrian. Okay. You got a poem, Adrian? I got a couple. They're cool. not original, but I did want to like jump on and share them. Absolutely. Uh, one is one is W. B. Yeats, and the other is Dylan Thomas. Cool. Which Yeats poem is it? I got the book. <laughs> yeah, let me jump to that one. I I actually had the um, the Thomas one first, but the Yeats one is. You can read the Thomas one first, but just tell me which Yeats one you're going to read. <laughs> Yeah, the eighth one is the sorrow of love. Sorrow of love? Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm going to look for it. I'll read that one first, since we talked about it. <laughs> the brawling of a sparrow in the eaves. The brilliant moon and all the milky sky, and all that famous harmony of leaves had blotted out man's image and his cry. A girl arose that had red mournful lips and seemed the greatness of the world in tears, doomed like Odysseus and the laboring ships and poured as Priam murdered with his peers, arose, and on the instant clamorous eaves, a climbing moon upon an empty sky, and all that lamentation of the leaves could but compose man's image and his cry. The Thomas one is uh, In My Craft or Sullen Art, which is a pretty well-known one. Maybe you know it. In My Craft or Sullen Art, 
exercised in the still night when only the moon rages and the lovers lie abed with all their griefs in their arms. I labor by singing light, not for ambition or bread or the strut and trade of charms on the ivory stages, but for the common wages of their most secret heart, not for the proud man apart from the raging moon I write on these spinthrift pages, not for the towering dead with their nightingales and psalms, but for the lovers, their arms round the griefs of the ages, who pay no praise or wages, nor heed my craft or art. You got something there, Sherry? It looks like you're looking for something. I think I've got a pretty a pretty good... Uh, I haven't read this before, <laughs> but the title just jumped out at me. I was like, oh, this sounds like a little corner of the internet uh, poem. Let me just... It's not long. Uh, it was written by Yeats in uh, 1931. It's called The Delphic Oracle Upon Plotinus. <laughs> so I thought, oh, this is good. Behold that great Plotinus swim buffeted by such seas. Bland Radamanthus beckons him, but the golden race looks dim. Salt blood blocks his eyes. Scattered on the level grass or winding through the grove, Plato there and Minas pass. Their stately Pythagoras and all the choir of love. I'm going to read it again. Behold that great Plotinus swim, buffeted by such seas. Bland Rant Radamanthus beckons him, but the golden race looks dim. Salt blood blocks his eyes. Scattered on the level grass or winding through the grove, Plato there and Minos pass. Their stately Pythagoras and all the choir of love. It, it, it rings of that section in Dante where he meets all the um, the great philosophers in that garden. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. What do you you got you want to read yours now, Nate? You you were gonna start oh, reading. Let, that let, let, Noah, let Noah go. Let Noah go. Oh, can, I'll, I'll go really fast and I'll oh, no, okay, don't be sorry. fast. Take your time. The scar on my forehead is almost gone. Will I forget? The blinding spray of water, the stumbling, bumping, the looks of horror on young faces, the blood running down my face, the trip cut short. The duct tape, the prideful look of a boy who fancied himself a king, the glue from a snail to seal the life in. What about everything else? Shameful memories hidden under couch cushions, a brother's head broken on a piano, six staples, a struggling breath of a seal at night, midnight poison, a spinning flaming sword. Mm. Mm. I feel like I want to. I feel like I want to read a silly poem. Can I read a silly poem? Yeah. <laughs> can, this was. I, I wrote poem. this. I wrote this uh, when the Bridges of Meeting Discord first started, and they they also um, had the Writers Discord server, and I was pretty active in there actually. And Tyler, 
was there and both was there at the time and we were always going back and forth we were actually doing these like silly little uh, throwing poems at one another especially both and tyler they were constantly like doing this like little poem battle thing you know and they were really good um anyways tyler wrote something about flirting i i wrote something some poem about an animal and then he 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 kind of did a one up me with his floridian gator okay his gate his alligator so i write I, I wrote this back to tyler it's called that floridian gator you speak too soon my floridian friend not everyone who calls from a porch meets such an end there's a story that's told a book with some scribble special knowledge of old that of mrs doolittle whispers bird shouts in lizard and laughs in accord, runs with chickens, sits with dogs, and philosophizes with fjords. Listens close when Al speaks of his night, fluttering frantically, jumping with squeals of delight. She can't be afraid, not even a hater, of that scaly old beast, that Floridian gator. A look in his eye as he swims up to drink, catching sight of Doolittle. She smiles, and he winks. <laughs> <laughs> so uh I have a I have a poem that I that I like that that I used to like a lot more when I was when I was younger. Um and I I Do you know the Goethe poem Prometheus by chance? No. Terry? Okay. So I think there's something I think that 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 Goethe has a an intuition of what I, when I say that Christianity is the religion that is not a religion, I think Goethe has an intuition Definitely. of that in this poem. So um, let's see, we'll see how it lands with other people. But I think that the, that there's there's something there's actually a really good impulse in this poem. And this um, is one you've poem. written. No, no, no. This is Goethe. Oh, Goethe. Okay. Yes. Cool. I will read my poem later. Maybe I should pull a grim thing, and it's like, hey, if we meet X in such uh, level of donations, <laughs> I will read my poem. <laughs> Who are we donating to? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is the, but this is good to good to spawn Prometheus. I actually like. Uh, I know this poem pretty well because I actually used it as part of a um, uh, a poetic interpretation. For a speech and debate competition many, 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 many years ago when I was much younger. This translation is a little bit different than the one I did then, but I still know the basic content of the poem pretty well. Okay, so here it is. Prometheus. Cover Prometheus. thy spacious heaven, Zeus, with clouds of mist, and like the boy who lops the thistle's heads to sport with oaks and mountain peaks. Yet you must leave my earth still standing, my cottage too, which was not raised by thee. Leave me my hearth, whose kindly glow by thee is envied. I know not poorer under the sun than ye gods. Ye nourish painfully with sacrifices and votive prayers your majesty. You would, in, you would in starve if children and beggars were not trusting fools. While yet a child and ignorant of life, I turn my wandering gaze up toward the sun as if with him. There was an ear to hear my wailings, a heart like mine to feel compassion for distress. Who helped me against the Titan's insolence? Who rescued me from certain death, from slavery? Didst thou do all this thyself? My sacred glowing heart, I glow its young and good, deceive with grateful thanks to yonder slumbering one. I honor thee, and why? Hast thou ever litten, lightened the sorrows of the heavy laden? Hast thou ever dried up the tears of the anguish stricken? Was I not fashioned to be a man by omnipotent time? And by eternal fate, masters of me and thee, didst thou e'er fancy 
that life I should learn to hate and fly to deserts because not all my blossoming dreams grew ripe. Here sit I, forming mortals after my image, a race resembling me, to suffer, to weep, to enjoy, to be glad, and thee to scorn as I. Whenever I hear these guys, German speakers, I always want to know what the German poem says because they're probably. I could yeah. probably find the German if you want to take a look no. at it. Or just well, maybe just send it to me because okay. um, I'd have to yeah have to read it. There's just so much more. It's like the you know the the terms that we know so well from people like Heidegger. They don't get translated right. because they're really difficult to encapsulate in, in like they, they're so much bigger, you know, mensch, gestalt, you know, things like right. that. I have to go pretty soon, but I can um, share you inspired me to pull up this old little silly poem I wrote. Cool. I'll, say that <laughs> I'll, I'll get out. A raindrop falls on my head. I can't see where it came from. A cloud is in the way. <laughs> That's great. That is really good. That me. I love that poem, Noah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it says a lot. Bye, Noah. Have a good day. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Noah. That poem actually says a ton. <laughs> Yeah, really good. I, but I think here's the thing, though, about that about that that Goethe poem, Prometheus, and why I would defend it. It's like, in as much as it is an atheist, it, it, an atheistic poem, mm -hmm. it's an atheistic poem about a, a god that's an idol, and clearly so, which is why I think yeah. it's addressed to Zeus. Yep. Um, because which we clearly understand as being an idol, and mm -hmm. there are things within the poem that point toward a different understanding of divinity. Well, this is you laying underneath the raspberry bushes, my friend. Right. Okay. This is what you're doing. And I'm going to read this on Girl Country at some point, but there's a an essay by George MacDonald on Shelley. And Shelley was accused of being an atheist. And a lot of people at the time were like, ooh, you can't read that. That's like, it's ungodly, you know. But he was doing the same thing. He was pointing at, which is also what, what Nietzsche was doing, right? This is why people are starting. It's it's so funny to me how people take so long. They get so hung up on the on the on the berries you can see from the top. You know, if I want to keep using my analogy, that they fail to see like the the treasures that you can only see when you're upside down, right? Well, um, specifically the 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 god that Nietzsche is so angry about is the abstract, disembodied, right. disincarnated one. That's my point. Yeah. That had become yeah. the dominant image of God in his era. Right. And so this is what George MacDonald argues for Shelley in the essay. Right. right. Which is just, you know, I mean, here's this preacher right. defending an atheist, right? right. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Should be good. I haven't read it yet. <laughs> I haven't sat down with it yet. What the, I'm going to go pretty soon too, but what mm -hmm. the, what the Goethe poem made kind of like conjured back to me was the ending lines of um, Ulysses by Wordsworth. Yeah. Oh. It, it ends on that same kind of a structure. Yeah. Yeah. I've got that one, I think. You want to read it? Oh, let me see if I can find it. I just, Wordsworth, right? <clears throat> Ulysses. There's also an essay by George MacDonald on Wordsworth in there, in the book that I got recently. Oh, it's not in here. It's not in this book. I can probably, I mean, I can, if I can get my you keyboard to operate, I can find it. Yeah, I yeah, can yeah. get it off the internet too. If yeah, you... go ahead and pull it up. Why don't you grab it and read it, Adrian? Yeah, go for it, Adrian. Meanwhile, I'm going to plug in a different keyboard because this keyboard is just like not one. Yeah, it's just like this wireless. 
So I replaced the batteries, but it's still just like it only wants to work intermittently. Thanks for coming, time. Noah. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoy having you, Noah. Yeah. Well, everybody. Well, I'm gonna have to. Noah and I are gonna have to like hang out in person because he's not. He's in Bellingham. Oh, you're kidding. No, your neighbors. Yeah. Almost. Almost. I Almost. Mean, you know, a few hours. Yeah, yeah. Did you find it, Adrian? Um, I'm working on it. Okay. I'm just plugging in a different keyboard. I have this. Maybe while you're looking for it, I'll read something from this book. You could read. Uh, you could read. You were talking about Shelley. You could read us a Shelley poem. I could read you a Shelley poem. Yeah. Yeah, Shelley. I had, awesome. a, I had a. I had a. I had a. One of my English teachers in college. She actually named her. She named her son, Bish. After yeah. Shelley. Yeah. Okay. Well, since we're talking and about, I'm, re homework, I'm ready now. Whenever. Okay, you go. You go. You go. You go first. Me. Okay. Well, this so this is Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson. So it was Tennyson, not Wordsworth. It was Tennyson. Oh, well, that's why I couldn't find it. <laughs> oh, here it is. But it's really the ending that mostly what Goethe invokes to me about it was the ending, kind of the last move that he makes at the end was very like this. So Tennyson would be would be would be fashioning his poem after Goethe because didn't they come after? Didn't yeah, it come after right. Goethe? Yes. Yeah, probably. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. It little profits that an idle king by this still hearth among those barren crags matched with an aged wife. I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race that hoard and sleep and feed and know not me. I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those that loved me and alone on shore. And when through scudding drifts, the rainy Hyades vex the dim sea, I am become a name for always roaming with a hungry heart. Much have I seen and known cities of men and matters, climates, councils, governments, myself not least, but honored of them all and drunk delight of battle with my peers. Far on the ringing plains of windy Troy, I am a part of all that I have met, yet all experience is an arch where through that was a tough one for me where through where through untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever when i move how dull it is to pause to make an end to rust unburnished not to shine in use as though to breathe were life life piled on life were all too little and of one to me little remains but every hour is saved from that eternal silence something more a bringer of new things and vile it were for some three sons to store and hoard myself and this gray spirit yearning in desire to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought. This is my son, mine own Telemachus, to whom I leave, or Telemachus, to whom I leave the scepter and the isle, well loved of me, discerning to fulfill this labor 
by slow prudence to make mild a rugged people and throw soft degrees, subdue them to the useful and the good. Most blameless is he, centered in the sphere of common duties, de decent not to fail in offices of tenderness and pray. Meet adoration to my household gods. When I am gone, he works his work, and I work mine. There lies the port. The vessel puffs her sail. There gloom the dark, broad seas, my mariners, souls that have toiled and wrought and thought with me, that ever with a frolic welcome took the thunder and the sunshine and opposed free hearts, free foreheads. You and I are old. Old age hath yet his honor and his toil. Death closes all, but something ere the end, some work of noble note, may yet be done, not becoming men that strove with gods. The lights begin to twinkle from the rocks, the long day wanes, the slow moon climbs, the deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends. Tis not too late to seek a newer world. Push off, and sitting well in order smite the sounding furrows, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be well shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles, whom we knew, though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. When equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. That was a really great reading. Thanks, Adrian. Fantastic. Yeah. Really good. I can see why Tennyson made it into this little book. <laughs> I'm being silly. <clears throat> well, I'm going to run away now. I'm going to go okay. back to the comment section. Thanks for joining us. It yeah, really thank nice you. To, to yeah, thanks for us. having me. It was really, yeah. um, yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. And I'll do it again. Cool. Awesome. But I get yeah. a little camera shot. So <laughs> do you do you write do you write your own poetry too, Adrian? Just curious. I don't write poetry, I write fiction. Oh. Okay. Right on. Nice. We might have to do that well, might have to be the next project. We might have to have a fiction screen. Yeah. All right, Sherry. You got something for us? Uh, do you want to hear a Shelley poem? I do actually. Do you mind though? I was, I don't know if Hezzy was still in on the stream, but this actually Hezzy put the the idea in my mind earlier. So I want to read a poem by um, uh, Yehuda Amakai, who's like the first the first poet mm. to write in um, uh, contemporary conversational Hebrew. So okay. obviously, I'm going to read it in translation because I don't read Hebrew. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's the the poem is called the the Amen Stone. Um, and it's translated by Hannah Block. On my desk there is a stone with the word Amen on it, a triangular fragment of stone from a Jewish graveyard destroyed many generations ago. The other fragments, hundreds upon hundreds, were scattered helter skelter, and a great yearning, a longing without end fills them all first name in search of family name 
date of death seeks dead man's birthplace. Son's name wishes to locate name of father. Date of birth seeks reunion with soul that wishes to rest in peace. And until they have found one another, they will not find a perfect rest. Only this stone lies calmly on my desk and says, Amen. Mm. But now the fragments are gathered up in loving kindness by a sad, good man. He cleanses them of every blemish, photographs them one by one, arranges them on the floor in the great hall, and makes each gravestone whole again, one again, fragment to fragment, like the resurrection of the dead. A mosaic, a jigsaw puzzle, child's play. Wow. <laughs> yeah, really good, right? <laughs> I had that scene from the Golden Key going through my mind where she meets the, the man, um, the old man of the fire in the center of the earth, and he's just a baby playing on the yeah. floor with all the balls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's so mm -hmm. much like that. Like it's like that. Yeah, I mean, there's so much in that. Like Luke should memorize that poem. Like there's Luke so many of. Memorize. Them. Oh yeah, yeah, Luke, that, Luke yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't so. know if that's a connection. I don't know if, if Luke has ever made the direct connection between what he talks about as the, in the mosaic vision and the resurrection of the dead. I don't know if he's actually, I don't know if he's actually made that link yet, but they are connected, Luke. <laughs> I'm going to read a Lord Byron poem. Okay. She walks in beauty. 1815. She walks in beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies. And all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes. Thus mellowed to that, ten that tender light which heaven to gaudy day denies. One shade the more one ray the less, had half impaired the nameless grace which waves in every raven tress or softly lightens o'er her face, where thoughts serenely sweet express how pure, how dear their dwelling pit place. And on that cheek and o'er that brow, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent, the smiles that win, the tints that glow, but tell of days in goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. Mm. I have a favorite, um, well, I, I don't care for much of what he did after the album, but there's a guy named Kevin Prosh, and he did a an album with the Black Peppercorns called Stumbling Something or Other. And he has a song called She Walks in Beauty, which is after this poem that, that I just read. It's really beautiful too. I'll post it. I'll post it once in the uh, in the Discord. So do you want to hear now a Shelley one? Yeah, absolutely. Right? Um, well, we've got Ozzy Mandius in here, which everybody knows. Maybe we should do something different. Um Let's go here, 202. Hmm. While you're looking, I can read another Yehuda Amakai poem. Yes, please. Yeah. This one is called The Child is Something Else Again. A child <laughs> is something else again wakes up in the afternoon in an instant he's full of words in an instant he's humming in an instant warm instant light instant darkness a child is job they've already placed their bets on him but he doesn't know it he scratches his body for pleasure nothing hurts yet they're training him to be a polite job to say thank you 
when the Lord has given, to say you're welcome when the Lord has taken away. A child is vengeance. A child is a missile into the coming generations. I launched him. I'm still trembling. A child is something else again. On a rainy spring day, glimpsing the Garden of Eden through the fence, kissing him in his sleep, hearing footsteps in the wet pine needles. A child delivers you from death. Child, garden, rain, fate. Wow, that is really yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, up cycle. Okay. Wants to hear Ozzy Mandius. Um. 1818 by Percy Bysshe Shelley. I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well, whose passions read or read, tell that its sculptor, well, those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my work, see mighty in despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, Boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. I've always really liked that poem. <laughs> it's just giving me goosebumps down the back of my head, which is a really odd place for me to get goosebumps. <laughs> I'm always very, hmm. <clears throat> hmm. hmm interesting. He's got a lot I've of got, really long. Oh, go ahead. I've got I've got one more by uh, Yehuda Amakai here. Okay. This is called Autobiography in the Year 1952, which is the year my mom was born. Hmm. Um. So. Uh the the poet here was born in 1924 in Germany, by the way. So. Um. All right. My father built a great worry around me like a dock. Once I left it before I was finished, and he remained with his great empty worry, and my mother like a tree on the shore between her arms outstretched for me. And in 31, my hands were merry and small, and in 41, they learned to use a rifle. And when I loved my first love, my thoughts were like a bunch of colored balloons, and the girl's white hand clutched them all, with a thin string and let them fly. And in 51, the movement of my life was like the movement of many slaves rowing a ship and the face of my father like the lantern at the end of a parting train. And my mother closed all the clouds in her brown closet and I climbed up my street. And the 20th century was the blood in my veins, blood that wanted to go out to many wars. Through many openings, it pounds on my head from inside and moves in angry waves to my heart. But now, in the spring of 52, I see more birds have returned than left last winter, and I return down the slope of the mountain to my room where the woman's body is heavy and full of time. Did you find the one you were looking for, Sherry? When you read that child one, by the same yeah. poet. Um, yeah. I thought of this one. I wrote this a long time ago about my kids. All right. Go for it. I turned it into a song, so it you know, kind of sounds like a song, but I'm not going to sing it. Um, and you're all that we have, and we gave you to him. I hold you in my dreams, and there you go again. And I know it's all right, but I'm holding so tight. It's the strangest thing, and I long to sing of it. Keep me from hurting you with a love so strong. Let me see you sing, see you sing your song. And I don't want to do you, do you wrong. 
Take this to heart, and more keep it there, and like the Virgin, for you, when it all becomes clear, I'll hold back the tears, joyful tears. Hmm. All right. Let's uh, drop the link one more time and see if anybody wants to come and play with us. Since we're since we're so so um, somehow melancholy in this stream, I'm, I want to read. I brought this last time, but it just didn't feel right to read anything from it. But I can't remember who it was. Somebody in the comment section on one of our videos recommended this book, The Dark Interval by Rainer Maria Rilke. Mm -hmm. And there are letters that he wrote to friends who were grieving. Mm. And um, I just want to read, um, well, maybe I'll just read the first one. Let's read the first one. This is to Mimi Romanelli. Mimi Romanelli lived from 1877 to 1970. The younger sister of the Italian art dealer and archaeologist Pietro Romanelli was known for her beauty and musical talent. Rilke stayed in her family's small hotel in Venice in 1907. They had a romantic relationship and maintained a long correspondence. And most <laughs> interestingly, most of the most of the letters written in here are written to women, and most of them he had a romantic relationship with. <laughs> <laughs> he was a busy guy. No wonder he died young. I mean, he was a poet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a bad joke. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> Sunday, December the 8th, 1907, Oberneuland near Bremen in Germany. There is death in life, and it astonishes me that we pretend to ignore this. Death whose unforgiving presence we experience with each change, we survive because we must learn to die slowly. We must learn to die. That is all of life. To prepare gradually the masterpiece of a proud and supreme death, of a death where chance plays no part, of a well-made, beatific, and enthusiastic death of the kind the saints knew to shape of a long-ripened death that effaces its hateful name and is nothing but a gesture that returns those laws to the anonymous universe which have been recognized and rescued over the course of an intensely accomplished life. It is this idea of death which has developed inside of me since childhood from one painful experience to the next and which compels me to humbly endure the small death so that I may become worthy of the one which wants us to be great. I am not ashamed, my dear, to have cried on a recent early Sunday morning in a cold gondola as it was gliding around endless corners through parts of Venice, so vaguely visible that they seemed to extend into another city far away. The voice of the ba Bar Barciolo, who called out to the granted passage at the corner of a canal, received no answer as in the face of death. And the bells that I had heard in my room only moments before, my room where I have lived my whole life, where I was born and where I am preparing to die, seemed so clear to me. Those same bells trailed their sounds like rags behind them over the swirling waters, only to reconnect without recognition. It is still this death which continues inside of me, which works in me, which transforms my heart, which deepens the red of my blood, which bears down heavily on the life that had been ours so that this death becomes a bittersweet drop coursing through my veins and permeating everything and which ought to be mine forever. And while I am completely engulfed in my sadness, I am happy to sense that you exist, beautiful one. I am happy to have flung myself without fear into your beauty, just as a bird flings itself into space. I am happy, dear, to have walked with steady faith on the waters of our uncertainty all the way to that island, which is your heart and where pain blossoms. Finally, happy. So... We had a comment here from uh, Anselman, the Scots song, 
Dark Lachnagar, I think was mm -hmm. a Byron lyric. And actually, he's right. I looked it up. Cool. And it is Lachnagar, published in 1807. I did. I I didn't know that it was based on because I know the I know the song he's talking about because I've heard the Corey's version of it, um, but I didn't know it was based on a. Um, I, I didn't know it was based on a Byron poem, so um, we'll go ahead and read that. Are you going to sing uh, it? Nate? <laughs> I'm not going to. I'm not going to sing it. No, I don't know it well. I I don't know the song well enough to sing it. Um, um, but maybe I'll learn it well enough to sing it. And I'll dedicate it to Anselman. Can we play the, can we, Anselman? I can, play, I can totally play the Corey's song. Yeah, hold on a second. Let me find Can we do that record. on YouTube? Like, without uh, getting yeah, in trouble? Yeah, I'm sure we can do it. On the live if stream, it, we can get away with it. If it's a video? I think we can get away with it. Okay, here we go. Uh, all right, so let me go back to StreamYard here and then do this. We want to share screen. Uh, also share tab audio yes all right here we go so you should be able to let me know if you can hear it sherry when i start playing yeah okay can't hear anything yet yeah, but maybe there's no, music. there's no music there we go here we go that's good it's not low he gardens so roses in you let the minions a luxury roll and restore me the rock where the snowflake reposes if still they are sacred to freedom and love Brave Caledonia, dear are thy mountains. Round their white summits, no elements war. Though cataracts roar, instead of smooth flowing fountains, I sigh for the valley. My young footsteps in infancy wandered. My cap was the bonnet, my cloak was the blade. On chieftains departed, my memory lingered as daily I strayed through the vine covered lane. I sought not my home till the day's dying glory gave place to the rays of the bright polar star. My fancy was cheered by the bold martial story as told by the sons of dark of the God. Years have rolled on, Loch Nagar, since I left you. Years must roll on ere I see you again. Though nature of verdure and flowers bereft you, yet still art thou dearer than Albion's plain. England, thy duties are tame and domestic to one who has roved on the mountains above. Oh, for the crags that are wild and majestic, the steep frowning glories of dark of the Great Caledonia, dear are thy mountains. I sigh for the valley, O dark Lord. No 
star. Now the brave did no vision foreboding tell you that fate had forsaken our cause. Yet were you destined to die at Culloden, though victory crowned not your fall with applause. Yet were you happy in death's earthy slumbers, to sleep where you're clad in the caves of Ema. The beebrock resounds to the piper's loud numbers, your deeds stay the echoes of dark love the God, your deeds stay the echoes. Brave Caledonia, dear are thy mountains. I sigh for the valley. <laughs> there we are. That's great. Thanks, Anselman. That yeah. was a great. That was a great little. It's it's very. It, whoops! I accidentally put it auto place. Oh, it's not. I'm not sharing it, but it accidentally started auto playing another Corey song <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> Anselman says thanks, Nate. Yeah. I love the Corys. I've never heard of the Corys, actually. <clears throat> I think the uh, was it the did I sing it on a live stream or at my party? But I, <laughs> the version of the Loch Loman song that I sang was from was the Corys version. Oh, okay. Yeah. So. Nice. Yeah. Is anybody going to join? Speaking of which, I just want to talk a little bit about those old, the, the old, the old Scottish and Irish folk songs. They are really outstanding as poems. Oh gosh, yes. Even independent of the music, like the like the music, like the the, the music, like the music of the phrasing itself, even without even without music mu music, which is why I think, which is why I think in the Appalachian tradition there, which is mm -hmm. mostly a cappella, because people were too poor to have instruments. It, like they still sound so great because the actual like there's just so much ri richness in the actual construction of the phrasing of the songs and they tell and 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 their narrative and structure at the same time and their images are are just amazing like like thinking of the 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 Corey the, the Corey's version of the Loch Loman song is an old one of the older versions of the song and it, there's that there's that line um and his heart's blood ran red in the heather. I mean, that's it's hard to get a more powerful image than that. I mean, it's like, it's crazy powerful. Anyway, so that's it. Yeah. So that's that's my defense of any if I decide to to uh to share uh old Scottish or Irish folk song or a Welsh well, folk song. It's funny because on my on my my parents' genealogy. My mother comes from um, Scottish, a Scottish background. I mean, her dad, her her grandfather was Scottish, and her grandmother was French. Well, I don't know how French, but she was French speaking anyway. And on my on my dad's side, my dad's family is Irish. And um, so whenever I hear any of any of that music, I'm just like, I get all nostalgic. I don't know why. <laughs> The so, like, the <laughs> has lots of Scotch Irish and Appalachia. Yeah, that's an understatement. It's like yeah. it's overwhelmingly, yeah. Um, yeah. Although it's also it's interesting because it, it it's also a blend. Um, but that's the dominant that's the that's the dominant flavor of the blend of the blend though. Uh, my that's where my my granny uh, my granny Heil her maiden name was Weaver. And her people were originally from the mountains of Tennessee, and like that's her back. That's so she, her family is Scottish. Um. So, in fact, uh, by way of Normandy, oddly, 
because the the, we, the Weaver family name was originally Dewev. So they were very tall people, the Weavers. My granny, my granny. My granny, even though she was born in 1924, was a little over five foot eight, which was very tall. For My internet's woman. struggling. Sorry, Nate. Can oh, it's you okay. see, can you hear me? Yeah. I was just talking about the fact that my granny was really tall, and that the the weavers were really tall people. Her brothers were all like six four plus. Can you hear me? Am I lagging, Nate? You must be because you don't seem to be hearing me. Totally, I'm totally lagging. <laughs> Oh, oh uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a uh, check out the Scott Group run rig version of Lock Lomond. Oh yeah, right, right, yeah. I've I've heard of I've heard them before. I like them. I'll, I'll, I'll I haven't heard their cover their version of Lock Lomond though. I will check it out. So the audience is able to hear us, but we're not hearing each other. It seems like. <laughs> I hear you now. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can you hear, hear me you. okay, I've Nate? Able, yeah, I've been able to hear you just fine the whole time. I'm going to go up. You. Okay. Go out and come back in. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Adrian, I'm not that. Yeah, like I was talking, I was talking about how tall the weavers are. I'm, I'm like six foot one and change. I'm not that tall, but my my son's six five though. Um, and the and like the Heil, like the the German side, the Heil side. Um, but my my grandfather, my grandpa Heil was five eleven, which was reasonably tall for him. And he was born in 1917 and. For his era, that was reasonably tall. Um, and my dad's like right about six foot even. Um, so uh, not as tall as the weavers. The weavers were tall, lanky folk. We, the Hiles are not as tall and stouter as my physique will attest. <laughs> All right. Well, I will go ahead and bite the bullet and read this poem that I am somewhat hesitant to read. Uh, bear in mind, this is a very, like I, I wrote this actually just like maybe 30 minutes before the stream. It's a rough draft. It's for the prompt that I got stuck on because I didn't, the prompt that I wrote this for was, um, let me, let me see where this was. Let me get it straight. Basically the, uh, the gist of it was, is to, to shine a light in a dark place that you don't want to. And, see what happens um so which is always a challenging thing to do so i don't have a title for this yet it's a very rough draft um and uh here we go oh now my mouse is gonna be first it was the keyboard now it's the mouse <laughs> oh Okay, the tech guys don't want me to read this poem. Okay, here we go. Finally, cooperating. All right. Forgive me, Diego. Though I never wanted you to come into our lives, neither did I want to cast you out into the world to be eaten by birds of prey, dogs, or beaten hungry coyotes. I knew if I scared you into fleeing out the open sliding glass door into the garden that it was a death sentence despite my ex-wife's assurance that she, we were setting you free. It was I who, was, who had warned that you would not, wouldn't make a good pet for our small two-bedroom apartment. I said that you would poop everywhere, everywhere and chew through everything, but she wanted you and would not take no for an answer. I was angry. I, I was not angry at you for being what you are but she could not deal with the reality of owning you. Did she just get bored of you and want to move on to the next thing? I wonder now in retrospect, whether it was really an accident when Salinger or Parakeet escaped. 
She didn't like caging animals and often let the parakeet roam free during the day. Was it really an oversight to leave the window open while cleaning when you know a parakeet is roaming free in the house? You, Diego, did not seek the freedom of the open back door on your own. She had to make she had she had to make me her executioner to frighten you away. I had to open myself to the spirit of the wolf. Get down on all fours and snarl menacingly. Make sudden, unpredictable movements. I am not the first man to turn himself into a beast on account of a woman he believed he loved and who he hoped loved him back. Sorry, I'm having like my screen is like cutting off part of my text here. I'll start from the beginning of that stanza. I'm not the first man to turn himself into a beast on account of a woman who he who he believed he loved and who he hoped loved him back. It took longer than it did for you and Salinger, but eventually she grew bored with me as well. I, like you, had to be forced out the door. Unlike you, I found life and love again on the other side. St. Diego, dear innocent prince of rabbits, pray for me. And so that's that's it. That was my poem that resulted from shining a light where I did not want to shine it. And that was the thing that got me uh, falling behind on the uh, on the poem a day challenge. And here I am monologuing, which is something I hate to do. Um, I thought Cherry was coming back. Hmm. Yeah, poor rabbit. Yeah, exactly. That's why I felt that. Yeah, that's exactly why it was a hard place. To, like, that's that's exactly it. It's like, yeah, I feel terrible. It's like, you know, it's like, uh, yeah. I don't know what else there is to say. I mean, other than what I said in the poem. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, well, I'm going to drop the link one more time and see if anybody wants to come in. And I will Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, that's of course. I mean, that's like but but you know, it's that's that's probably not a very realistic scenario. Um uh for sure. Um You know, we had a, we had a um we had a place a, a few years back uh over in East Olympia and we had um we had we just had so many rabbits in our in our yard um and uh little tiny tiny like baby rabbits um yeah I think so I think we'll have to end it there um and uh hope to see you all next time um please don't hesitate to participate this this uh we want we want participation um i appreciate you all and uh i'm going to go ahead and end the stream now and uh hope hope sherry is able to get back online at some point <laughs> bye-bye now <laughs>